Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Erwin Sturr, Ken Hayes, Philip Shane, and new patrons, Sonny and Bobby. <laughs> Welcome, Sonny. Welcome, Bobby. On this episode of DTNS, Google will not be broken up, and the Department of Justice hasn't even asked for that yet. Wimbledon will replace humans with AI, and why Nobel Prizes are all going to AI scientists, and they should. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, October 9th, 2024. In Los Angeles, I'm Tom Merritt. In Salt Lake City, I'm not Sarah Lane, I am Scott Johnson. And uh, I am the show's producer, Roger Chang. It's a weird week. I was off on Tuesday. Sarah and Rob did the show. Uh, Sarah's off uh, traveling for the rest of this week. And so today it's me and Scott. Tomorrow it'll be me and Rob. Uh, but mm. don't worry. Everything's fine. Everyone will reconvene uh, back together. Just a l- little travel, a little stuff going on, a little my dog getting neutered, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all, it's important stuff. All yeah, of those yeah, things, including those the last one. Yeah. yeah. Poor guy. Uh, <laughs> he'll come back a change dog. Uh <laughs> Meanwhile, we start with the quick hits. HBO released a documentary called Money Electric, The Bitcoin Mystery. It is the latest effort to try to figure out who created Bitcoin. We all know that Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin, but nobody has been able to figure out who Satoshi Nakamoto was. Uh, The documentary uses circumstantial evidence to suggest that a Canadian software developer named Peter Todd was Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, Todd's as likely a suspect as any uh, would possibly have the skills. Uh, Todd is an applied cryptography consultant based in Toronto. Uh, The white paper for Bitcoin was published in 2008. Todd was active back then. There's a lot of other evidence in the documentary. Uh, The network went online in 2009, and Nakamoto has not posted publicly since 2011, also holds Bitcoin wallets worth $62.4 billion. So whoever is Nakamoto is very rich. Todd says, not me. Although Mm. they got everyone in the documentary to look at the camera and say, I am Satoshi Nakamoto. So they have him on tape saying that, but it's because they got everyone they interviewed to say that. And he says, I just said that for the gimmick. It's not me. Wow. It's like that movie where everybody's... uh, uh the guy in the M&M. desert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's all M&M. Uh, also, let's talk about this. The governments of Turkey and Russia have ordered internet providers to block access to discord in their countries. Yeah, that's right. Russia said the block was due to violations of legislation meant to prevent, quote, the use of the messenger for terrorist and extremist purposes, the recruitment of citizens for their commission, the sale of drugs in connection with the placement of illegal information, unquote. Supposedly, Discord has not entered into conversation with Russian authorities about these accusations. In Turkey, Discord has reportedly blocked following a case, or it has been blocked following a case involving child abuse and obscenity content allegedly hosted on the Discord platform. Brazilian Supreme Court Justice Alexander de Moraes ordered regulators to take steps to allow Brazilians to get access to X.com after a five-week blockage. The order came after X agreed to take down some user accounts, pay fines, and appoint a legal representative in Brazil. If you recall, five weeks ago, the block was put in place because X would not agree to take down some user accounts, pay fines, or appoint a legal representative in Brazil. So they just caved. Uh, The person who was named their legal representative today, or, or earlier this week, was their legal representative five weeks ago, uh, and then she resigned Uh, And that's when they said, well, we're not going to appoint a new one. Uh, Apparently, according to the Associated Press, the new contract with her specifies that she, quote, must follow Brazilian law and court decisions and that any legal responsibility she assumes on X's behalf requires prior instruction from the company in writing, according to the company's filing. Uh, This appears to be a way of shielding her from liability if X tries to get her to do something that is against Brazilian law. I don't blame her. Last month, mysterious Nintendo hardware showed up in the U.S. FCC public filings and had MMware sensors and Wi-Fi. Tuesday, Nintendo announced new hardware, but no, it's not the new Switch, as you were all hoping, as I was hoping. It's a motion-controlled alarm clock called Alarmo. Yeah, you heard me. 
Uh, you can snooze it with a gesture, and that's why it has a two, uh, 24 gigahertz MM wear, uh, wave sensor. It comes with 35, uh, 35 audio scenes from Breath of the Wild, Pikmin 4, Splatoon 3, Super Mario Galaxy, and the Ring Fit Adventure game uh, from Animal Crossing, New Horizons, and Mario Kart 8. That's part of why it has Wi-Fi. Uh, it even includes some sleeping tracking to see how much you move around in your sleep. It costs ninety nine ninety five in U.S. dollars and will be available in early 2025. Alarmo. I hate it. I would name an alarm <laughs> if I was me. It's a terrible name. Terrible name. Researchers from ESET have discovered a series of air-gapped attacks on government and diplomatic entities uh, one against a South Asian embassy in Belarus in 2019, and a series of attacks against other targets in Europe between May 2022 and March 2024. If you don't know what that is, air-gapped systems are not connected to the internet. They are <laughs> surrounded by air, not ethernet, uh, and don't have Wi-Fi. The idea is you can't get them, get to them over the internet. So you have to employ a human to go act as an agent or trick a human into plugging a USB drive into the air gap system to steal the data and then get that same human to plug that same USB drive into an internet connected system so you can deliver the data. That's and a that, lot of people involved in your hack. I mean, it could know? just be with the same person doing it, but yeah, That's true. a lot of persuasion. On August 5th, earlier this year, Judge Amit Mehta ruled that Google had abused its market position to maintain its monopoly in two areas, general search services and the market for general text advertising. Didn't find him guilty of a lot of other things, but those two things, it said, look, you can be a monopoly. You just can't use that position to keep out competitors. And you were doing that in those two areas. So the next step is for the judge to determine what the remedy is for that situation. Okay, you've been acting like a monopoly. You've been abusing that position. We're going to stop you from abusing that position by making you... Well, the next step is to hear ideas. Google can give ideas like, okay, you could try making us do this. Maybe that will remedy it. They're going to try to give the least impactful ideas. Tuesday, the U.S. Department of Justice filed a range of options it is considering recommending to the judge for a remedy. They range from a simple consent decree that would monitor Google's behavior and stop them from doing anything naughty. Uh, that, that, that happens a lot. Consent decrees are, are pretty normal. Uh, there's another idea in there of ordering Google to sell off Chrome, Android, or Google Play. <laughs> that would be uh, breaking up Google into multiple companies. Other possible remedies in the filing are uh, prohibiting exclusive search deals. That feels like one that I could imagine the judge accepting. Uh, those are the exclusive search deals that Google has with Apple and Samsung. Uh, there's one that says you, you should give ability for the websites to opt out of Google's AI products. Uh, put restrictions against investing in search rivals. Don't let Google go buy the competition and keep, you know, take them out of business. Providing more information to advertisers about where their ads appear. Forcing Google to share with rivals some of the data indexes and models so that they can compete better. Uh, and an, even an educational awareness campaign just to inform people, hey, other search engines exist, making, make, be, making Google pay for that. Uh, the judge does not have to follow any of these recommendations, but will consider them and can choose for them if he, if he wishes. Uh, and this isn't the final filing. This is the DOJ saying these are the four areas in which we are considering options. They have until November 20th to decide the specific fix that it prefers. So they could pick more than one of these, but but there will be a further filing that's the DOJ actually asking the judge, do this. These are just ideas to kind of plant in the judge's head. A two-week remedies hearing to hear both an argument for these ideas and Google's ideas will take place next April. So even after November 20th, we're not going to get the argument in front of the judge about what the remedy should be until April. And then after that hearing, the judge gave himself until August to decide what the remedy will be. So we're not even going to hear what this remedy is until at the earliest, sometime mid next year. He can decide before August, but a lot of times they take the full time. Once that's done... Google's going to appeal whatever the judge says. Like, yes, they're going to suggest remedies, but they don't want any remedies. They want this whole thing overturned. They're going to appeal the entire decision, but they have to wait for the remedy hearings to finish before they can move on and, and have an appeal heard. Uh, the appeal could get denied. Uh, that's certainly possible. 
it usually doesn't happen. So I feel comfortable saying, Scott, none of this is going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, every time this story like this comes out or we start talking about just Google and their size and anti-competitive behavior and various justice departments around the world making saber rattle noises, it almost always comes down to this is a process and you don't do it overnight and you're not going to suddenly wake up in 2025 in January and go, oh man, there are now 12 companies that used to be Google. What are we doing now? That's not going to happen. Um, what could happen, I suppose, in the long run, and I by long run, I mean long, um, is that they do lose the appeal. And then I think they have a recourse to do other kinds of appeals and maybe they lose those too. And maybe there is a future in 2035 where Google doesn't own everything anymore or it's been broken up. Um, but I don't think that's coming anytime soon. But it is interesting, right? Like it, when they come to those hearings, I'd love to hear what Google's ideas are. Like some of these that you laid out that they are, they're suggesting, they make sense to me. But will Google come to the table and say, well, here's what we're thinking. We're going to do... X, Y, and Z, and it's going to change everybody forever, and it's going to be awesome. I just kind of want to hear what that is. Yeah, what Google's going to do is look at what the judge was saying, find the arguments that are the least impactful, and try to get the judge to accept probably something like a consent decree. Like, yeah, yeah we, should, we should do a few things to make sure we're not abusing our position. These are the things, and put a consent decree in, and we'll agree not to do them. Uh, something very minimal. In case they get their appeal denied, or in case they lose on appeal, they, they want to set the bar as low as possible. Uh, chances are the judge will not go with Google's recommendation either. They'll, they'll go somewhere up. I'm still, I don't know why, my instinct is that the judge is going to say uh, Google is not allowed to have these exclusive search agreements anymore as one of the remedies. I doubt that he's going to require Google to sell off Chrome, Android, or, or Google Play, uh, not even one of them. Uh, I think that remedy is probably too extreme for this judge, but I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if yep. the Department of Justice even recommends that one. They put it in this filing, but they they may not end up putting it in their specific filing. Yep. Uh, do you play tennis, Scott? No, but I used to. When do you I was watch tennis? Um, occasionally when I remember to do it, when there's like a big thing, a Wimbledon or something like on, Wimbledon? I'll try to. Yeah, yeah. Right. I like, and, video, I like uh, tennis video games a lot. And I'll Wimbledon is in the summer, so sometimes you've got a little mm. little more flexible schedule to, to sure. watch things. Sure. Uh, do you know the All England Club that operates the Wimbledon? No, this is news to me. All England Club is the is is the the club that operates Wimbledon, the uh, the ten, All England Tennis Championship, which is a world tennis. It's one of the big four. It's one of the Grand Slam events. Uh, they announced Wednesday that this coming year, the All England Club will use live electronic line calling Whoa. to make out and fault calls at the Wimbledon Championships. No more line judges. They wow. tested the system during the 2024 tournament this past summer, but they still had the, the line judges there, the, the actual humans there. And, you, and the, the test system was to kind of see how well it worked. Apparently, it worked great. Uh, the All England Club considers it sufficiently robust. They're not the first to do this. It's been put in place in other tournaments. But, you know, it's the All England Club. It's Wimbledon. It's, it's very uh, staunched in lore and conservatism. Uh, yeah. So it's kind of a big deal that they're like, yeah, no more line judges. Line judges so, are kind of a huge part of the look of Wimbledon. You always see them, you know, standing there looking at the lines. Well, <laughs> when you have a when you have a tennis player as uh, present and as um, celebrity driven as say John McEnroe, who's he going to yell at now? Like I know he's out. He doesn't play tennis anymore. But when, when the next McEnroe comes yeah, right. along, Roger Federer is like that a little you're bit. You're out of your mind. It'll be you're out of your ram. Yeah, you're out of your RAM. Your you, your eye, your lenses needs wiping. Like, what do they? What do they? Is people your gonna algorithm yell at? corrupt? That was clearly <laughs> in. But it is. But it does open up that new envelope of like, all right. Well, now that we have these, what are their fail safes, or what what are the possible problems? What you know is it, is it going to be wrong, and why? When is it wrong, and why is it wrong when it's wrong? Okay, like but that let's, kind let's, of stuff let's, is an let's issue. Let's interrogate that exact point because that's yeah. what everybody thinks. Uh, yeah. By all accounts. These are better than humans. Yeah, they are more accurate than humans. Uh, I don't know how you measure that. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess you go back and you look at replays and 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 have multiple viewpoints and do things that would take more time. I'm like, if you can tell that it was wrong, then why don't you do the thing that could tell it was wrong live? It probably because it takes too much time. Uh, but again, by all accounts, these are more accurate than humans. 
nothing is perfect. Everything is going to be wrong. Maybe the answer, Scott, is we just have to tolerate that things can't be perfect. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no, that's be okay. right all the time. You have and, to, you have and the to only thing you can certain... do is upgrade the algorithm to be even more accurate in the future. Sure. You just accept a certain amount of fault uh, possibility. Yeah, and get it? it will, it will <laughs> I didn't even mean to do that. But it also is less, th- you're right, it's I'll... less than the humans out there on the line calling these shots. So I'm actually for this. I like this a lot. I wish it was in more sports. It's taken a long time for the NFL, took forever for the NFL to even do replays like look at the camera or even have that as an option. And even then it's so sparsely used. Like they just have to be careful with that stuff. I understand people's fears around it and the purity of the sports that they're in and the fandom that people have, but I'm all for automating some of this stuff because it does make more sense. What what I will say is a fair concern is what happens if the system goes down? Mm. Not is it wrong, but it goes offline, right? That yeah. hap- We all know that happens. The, sure. Like stuff gets buggy and it just, stops working the way you want it to work. Are we going to continue to have human line judges trained to step in, in those situations? Like, right, will they right. be available? They're like the, they're like self-driving cars requ- and, and us requiring that there's a dude in there, you know, we're, we're going to have to have some form of self-driving car dude in tennis. Yeah. Except he's not driving anything. He's just off to the side, making sure everything's okay. I hope it's a nerdy IT guy. Let's do that. Larry, Atlanta next thing says, up, I yeah. don't want this to happen in baseball. Why? Why that's, not? That's always my question. It took decades for them to use instant replay in sports. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of grousing and there were a lot of like not great implementations of how it worked. But I think everybody agrees it has made the sport better and they figured out how to keep it from, you know, totally derailing a game and, and delaying it. Uh, mm-hmm. If the computer is better at the thing, then I want that. Like, yeah, I I would much rather a computer had said, no, Don Deckinger is wrong. Uh, that man is out in the 1985 World Series instead of what we have now, which is a picture clearly showing the ball beating the runner. But, hey, we trusted the humans. That's the way the game goes. Like, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I I think, yes, arguing with the ump is part of the game, Larry is saying. Uh, but is it the best part of the game? And do you think this will stop them arguing with the ump? Like you can still have umpires. You're still going to have an umpire in tennis. You know, you have somebody refereeing the match. So I don't know. Yeah. My, I've got a friend who has argued with me before that the reason they don't automate more stuff saying basketball, his favorite sport is because of this very idea that somehow the refs are an integral, not just a part of the game, but an integral part of the game and not just for shot calling. It's for, existing and being mad at them that that's it's, part it's of the, the game it really is the it, we've always done it this way and i like it that way uh yeah. and, and that's that, that's a legitimate basis for having your argument but that is what that argument is is i yeah. like it the way it is you know yeah. even if it's imperfect um hey how, how is your utah hockey club doing uh i didn't pay attention to what the score was but we've had our first game yeah yeah I, 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 I caught a little of it i like the i like the very minimalist name yeah, they are. Cha- the, apparently, this is very temporary. I can say just a, re- a year, right? There's yeah. a yeah. There's a real name coming. A lot of people think they're sticking with this. This was just a holdover while they work out trademark and everything. Although so, one um, of the names they're considering is Utah HC. I saw. I yes, I saw that as well. Yeah. I really want the mammoth or uh, something cool. Blizzard. So you can have a good mascot. Blizzard would be cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah what and I want. then you can get Microsoft to sponsor the team. <laughs> Uh, folks, if you'd like to join in the conversation in our Discord, you can do that by linking to a Patreon account. Get your Patreon account, link it up to the Discord at patreon.com slash DTNS. University of Washington biochemist and computational biologist David Baker, those are, those are both his titles, not two different people. Uh, David Baker is the first of three winners of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. The other two are DeepMind CEO Demis Hassabis and senior DeepMind research scientist John Jumper. Uh, they won in chemistry for their work on discovering new protein configurations and specifically the tools that they created to help discover these. Hasabas and Jumper created the open source AlphaFold 2 AI model that helped predict the structure of almost all 200 million proteins that scientists have identified. Baker created a computational protein design for a protein no one had seen before in 2003. He was able to use computer 
resources in order to design a never-before-seen protein. He's since developed several new proteins, and those proteins are even used in vaccines and sensors and more. Uh, we talked yesterday about the the two pioneers in deep learning who were given the a Nobel Prize in physics. So we now have two Nobel Prizes that have been awarded to computer scientists which raises the idea that there might need to be a Nobel Prize for computer science at some point. Uh, and in fact, Scott, Dr. D wrote us an email and said, I had the same reaction as Sarah Lane. How is AI physics? I got my physics PhD more than 35 years ago, and unless they change the field on me, physics is the study of matter, energy, space, time, and their interactions. Like any other science, it is all about understanding the natural world. Nothing about artificial intelligence is the natural world. Uh, I did a little digging to kind of figure out why they gave the physics prize, but, but before we get to that, let's talk about the chemistry prize. What do you think of that? Well... Uh... I don't know about you. I feel like you maybe maybe we're the same here, and I'll let you speak for yourself. But I feel like there's always been a little sense in the back of my head that one day there'd be a convergence, that technology. I mean, I'll, I'll admit it; it's based mostly on the film Alien and its sequel, Aliens, where the synthetics are made of organic-like material, but they're still synthetics. They're still robots, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, but they got weird stuff running in there, and it's not muscle fiber; yeah. it's some other kind of fiber. Blood so of milk. I always, yes, exactly. So I always felt like there was a convergence coming, and that convergence would be this, 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 the field of academia, like the study of computer science and the study of things like physics would converge, because eventually we're going to be dealing with uh, with biological components and not always technical or technological components or the two things together or whatever. And so to me, this makes sense that you're going to start seeing these kinds of people uh, win uh, these kinds of awards or have this kind of notoriety. I still am a little thrown by the idea of how is AI physics, because I kind of agree with the writer, Dr. D. Mm -hmm. I think it's a it's probably some small thing that I don't understand about the way computer science works or the way AI works or something. Or maybe we're just now entering a phase where physics is part of this. If we were talking um, quantum computing, that mm. might take us much closer to a uh, you know a, a, a physics conversation because because quantum physics is essential exactly. to quantum computing. Is that okay? Yeah, right. exactly. And quantum physics is its own kind of focus, right? So I could see these things ha having those crossovers and stuff, but it is a little bit strange to to give one in physics in 2024 that is tied to AI. So it do it doesn't sound like the chemistry one confuses you as much no. as the physics one not like, at all the chemistry one just seems like the natural we are we've been heading that direction a long time yeah uh, not just in science fiction but like in real life we we just are you know we're, we're finding out they're ways making, to they're, they're getting a prize stuff. for making tools that helped a biological a biochem discovery right right Right. Uh, and that's like giving giving the prize for a microscope or something like you made the tool right. that helped discover the thing. Although actually right. Baker actually did some actual discoveries uh, of his own there, too. Um, so it's not just making the tool that he did. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the physics one definitely confused me as well. I, I, I was right there with Rob and Sarah when I first uh, saw it yesterday. Uh, I do want to talk to Dr. Nikki about this. I'm going to follow up with her on, because we, we've still got more Nobel Prizes to come. So once they're all out, I want to, I want to do like a, an overview of all of them with Dr. Nikki. But I did some digging and uh, Nature Magazine, uh, as you might have guessed, uh, has a very good article that explains what the physics connection is. Uh, and it's more direct than you might think. Uh, if I had to summarize it, it's the math. They took the equations that had been developed in physics and expanded upon them in order to figure out how to make neural networks and deep learning work. So what they're, be what they're being given the prize for is as much the expansion of the mathematics of physics, which physics and math are very intertwined, sure. uh, as it is the actual deep learning stuff that they developed. Uh, Hopfield 
had a background in physics. And if you're trying to remember, Hopfield was the one that laid the foundation that Hinton built on. Uh, Hopfield had a background in physics and described the connection between virtual neurons as physical forces. Uh, I'm going to take this from nature. Uh, Hinton, a computer scientist, used principles from statistical physics, which collectively describe systems that have too many parts to track individually, to further develop the Hopfield network. By building probabilities into a layered version of the network, he created a tool that could recognize and classify images or generate new examples, etc. So Hopfield's motivation was really physics. Uh, and he invented this model of physics to understand certain phases of matter, which then were applied to virtual neurons. Uh, and then Hinton expanded that physics. Uh, Lenka Zdebarova, a specialist in statistical physics of computation at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, said she was pleasantly surprised that the Nobel Committee recognized the importance of ideas from physics for understanding complex systems. So there was a physicist saying, I'm, I'm surprised that they recognized that this is important physics that they were doing because all every, everybody thinks about is the AI part of it. Uh, and both Hopfield and Hinton, uh, according to Yashua, Yashua Bengio, a computer scientist, said, uh, have brought incredibly important ideas from physics into AI. Does that change your understanding of why they got the physics prize at all? A little bit. One thing that just occurred to me, there was this joke we used to tease my mom about where she said, "My, I put a bunch of books on my Kindle and now it's heavier. And we laughed at her. <laughs> We're like, Mom, it doesn't work that way. You can't, you cannot tell the difference. But then somebody wrote in, I don't remember who they were, and they said, well, the truth of it is she can't perceive it, absolutely. No, but there is but, a physical nature to right. data. Data has has physics. It's a physical thing. And you can quantify it as such. So when you start thinking of it that way, and then you start talking about the, the complexities of even just your basic large language model, yeah, uh, and then moving on up to bigger stuff, then it starts to make sense. Oh, okay. Well, of course it's physics because physics is everything at the end of the day. But it's not even about the mechanical workings of the large language model. You know, it's not, right. not about the large language models getting heavier. It's right. saying the equations that Hopfield... Uh, created to understand phases of matter were applicable in this other situation. Right. But right. but forget the practical matter of it. He expanded the realm of physics by doing that, and then yeah. Hinton uh, expanded it even more. Yeah. So yeah. it's good. The the idea that these that, that that this is even a thing that we as people can hear about the award and understand why a physics uh, why, why physics and AI are mixed is a really good thing, I think, for the general public who's paying attention. It's just good good for us to think of this stuff yeah, yeah. differently, which is clearly what he's been doing his entire career. So, and the, It's always a problem with science, is that the scientists working in the field itself mm -hmm. don't always fully understand what every other scientist is doing because it's so complex. The scientists who are outside of the field but are scientists uh, often misunderstand what's happening in the field they're not in, Mm -hmm. And then the rest of us are out here trying to go like, wait, how is that physics again? And the, yeah. the physicists are like, well, it's actually, it is physics. And then you can be like Dr. D and say like, I think it's too far afield, too much of a stretch. Or you could be uh, like uh, the uh, Lenka Zdjavorova, who's like, no, this is important. And I'm glad they're recognizing it. You know, there's different opinions to be had about it. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, I think a lot of us are operating with 20th century definitions here that maybe aren't up to speed. Because we're not yep, physicists. That's fine. Yeah, time time to tweak it. Think different. All right, let's check out the mailbag. Dr. D also wanted to chime in on our discussion yesterday regarding Virginia congressional candidate Bentley Hensel, uh, who had created a chatbot version of his opponent uh, in order to <laughs> conduct a debate because his opponent wouldn't debate him. Uh, Dr. D says... The piece on Don Bayer's challenger who intends to debate a chatbot version of Don is especially amusing since AI is a topic that my congressman is very interested in. He's part of a bipartisan congressional AI task force, assembled a working group of AI experts, and was part of a bipartisan group in Congress that introduced a bill providing AI guidelines for federal agencies and contractors. I have to think that his challenger decided that an AI stunt would be apropos because of that. Interesting stuff. Thank you, yeah. Dr. D. Smart uh, guy, Dr. D. I like him. And thank you, Scott Johnson. You're a smart guy, too. Well, Dr. D sounds like a rapper, too, so I'm giving him double <laughs> credit. 
Uh, yeah, I, I really love being here. And let me tell you something else. When I'm not here, I'm doing lots of other cool stuff over at a little site called frogpants.com. And you might say, well, what's over at frogpants.com? Is it just frogs and pants? Mm. No, it's a whole slate of podcasts. It's, There's everything it's, it's... from video game stuff to film and TV, uh, popular culture, a regular morning show, just about anything your little heart desires. And we're real people, no AI involved. A little hint is about to come later on the show. Uh, anyway, go check it out. That's over at frogpants.com. That's frogpants. Dot com. That just made me think of an analogy. Oh, yeah? Video game physics. If uh, anyone yeah. ever wins a Nobel Prize for physics in video game physics, every video gamer is going to immediately understand why. Yeah. They're going to go, no, oh, right. yeah, no, I know that's not actual physics, but it's mm -hmm. expanding our understanding of physics. It's kind of what's going on here. Yeah. No, you're not Except You're not wrong. It's a virtual, a virtual physics. Obviously, it's different. But it's yeah, expanding we're gonna... the math and the theories mm -hmm. around physics, but not for you know, space and time and all of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Love it. Uh, well, patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We are aiming to have more and more fun on Good Day Internet, and uh, I think we're succeeding. Notebook LM knows it's AI. You might have heard the podcast episode that came out last week where they discovered this. Lots of people have been having fun with Google's Notebook LM because it simulates podcasts. So I decided to tell the Notebook LM hosts that... That was a lie, but <laughs> one of them is an AI and the other is human. So we're going to talk about all of this. Stick around. Uh, you can catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>